Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here, the Principal Storytelling Officer for the Hiswar Source Source Story video series, a video series for Canadian history teachers, where myself or our French host, we get to talk with historians or archivists or anyone really who is interested in history, even though they might not consider themselves a historian or an artist, which is a bit of a preview of today's talk, um, about one historical source. And we talk about what is the source what is the story and how can teaching with it challenge Canadian history? Because that's really our goal here, to challenge Canadian history. We don't want you just to bring these histories in and stir them all around in a kind of dominant narrative that we often get from textbooks. We really want to be able to tell these new stories about the Canadian nation. Well, they're not new stories. They're stories we might just not have talked about before. We want to be able to reimagine, rethink um, what, we, uh, what we and our students imagine the Canadian nation to be through the stories we talk about in this series and the sources that we bring to the fore. So anyway, I'm really excited for today's talk because we're going to be doing just that with an object that so many of us think about as kind of distinctly Canadian. But before we get into that, just a reminder that you can access this with both French and English subtitles below. So make sure you click the closed captioning if you would like to have access to the subtitles. We also have all of these social media that you can follow us on, which has been really, really wonderful to see um, how people have been using these ideas in the classroom, which has been so wonderful. And please join the conversation, um, you know, comment below, um, um, about how you might bring this into your classroom, like, share, do all those things that are good for the algorithms so that people get to know about these wonderful sources and these conversations that, if I do say so myself, are pretty exciting. And today I'm really excited for this talk because it is something that is so kind of distinctly Canadian, um, but it's that we're talking about it in a way that really shows this much broader history that we really don't talk about at all. So today we're talking with a non-historian, a non-archivist, um, although someone that does historian work and archiving work. Um, we're talking with Dr. Courtney Cizo, who is a professor in kinesiology at Queen's University in Ontario. And she is really known for talking about hockey and racism. And when we contacted her about participating in this series, she was, you know, more than happy to be able to talk about hockey and racism, and then to be able to really link to these longer histories of hockey and how it can really be understood as a very diverse multicultural sport with so many intersections with black history, with Indigenous history, and being able to talk with her about this particular source today um, really will be able to open up so many uh, stories or kind of questions about what we don't really know about these histories and how we might be able to capture some of these stories through things like doing oral history work or inviting oral histories into the classroom. So why don't we go over to Zoom talk to Courtney. I really, really am excited for this. I'm not really a hockey person, although of course, as someone that grew up in Canada for most of my history, uh, hockey has always kind of circulated around me. So I'm really excited for what this conversation is going to bring. Let's go over to Zoom. Courtney, hello. I'm so excited we're talking today. Um, and uh, it's a snowy day here in Toronto when we're filming. So that kind of makes sense that we're talking about like a snowy sport. So thank you so much for participating. Um, before we get into it, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for the invite. Um, my name is Courtney Sito. Last name rhymes with Despacito. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the uh, School of Kinesiology and Health Studies at Queen's University. Um, this is my fifth year at Queen's, born and raised in Vancouver, so I'm a West Coast transplant. Um, and my research up until this point has largely revolved around racism in hockey um, and a little bit of stuff around uh, waste created through sporting goods production um, and I'm venturing into a, a food project around anti-racism and reconciliation through food in Canada. So um, lots of different projects, uh, which is kind of the way that I like it. But uh, yeah, um, hockey and racism is kind of like the big thing that I'm quote unquote known for. 
Um, yeah, and what what I, what I love about the series is that I don't just get to talk with historians about topics that are historical, and so many topics, all topics are historical, um, because coming from a kinesiology background, bringing in stuff about racism and stuff about sport and stuff about movement and stuff about food, I think brings in such a more complex picture of things that we often feel like we know about or are kind of ahistorical. And I think hockey is one of them. And so I appreciate that you are known for this and that we get to talk about it today. So thank you again. No, I think that's a great point. And that's the conversation I've been having with my first year students this week is that for so long, sport has been thought of as something that is trivial. It's not worth studying because it doesn't have any any value in society other than leisure and um, kind of an escape from the real world problems. But I think the the funnest part for a lot of us is that if you're missing the sport conversation, you're missing a whole lot of complexity with respect to power and money and um, social norms and how they circulate in the world. Um, and yeah, as you said, like a lot of these things we think are ahistorical. It just it is the way it is. Um, and I had to do a lot of learning through this process as well, because I was raised in that same society thinking that, you know, hockey was a white man's game and um, it wasn't, it was only for certain people. Um, and there was a steep learning curve. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that it's so interesting how something that is understood as Canada's national sport, although it isn't, is such it is understood as such a white man sport and that that isn't problematized as both a as a thing that we say about hockey but also the ways that a sport like this has evolved because this isn't it, it, that's not where the kind of roots mm -hmm. are and um i think that's a really exciting way to kind of get into the source that you brought to us today yeah so i think the source we discussed you have like a a visual image, but I have the three D version. Of 2D. <laughs> I to. I do not have one of those in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start our conversation through uh, the hockey stick. That's great. Um, I love it because yeah, when we talk about hockey, is like this I, this idea that it was created by um, really gruff northern white Canadians to as a way to kind of survive and tame the Canadian wilderness. We're missing a whole lot of the story. <clears throat> and when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, that's actually how I started the introduction. I was like, hockey is a white man's game. Um, and my supervisor was like, you need to go do some more reading and come back to me with a new chapter. And I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> what, am I, what have I missed? Um, and it was through that extra set of reading where I was like, oh, OK, so there's an indigenous component to the history of hockey. There's a black component to the history of hockey. Um, and so what we know now is that the Mi'kmaq people of um, kind of like the what we know as the Maritimes and Nova Scotia now were some of the best hockey stick makers of the time um, that they were like extraordinary wood carvers. Um, and they were so good at making hockey sticks that they were actually mass producing them at a time when there wasn't really any kind of mass production. Um, so the indigenous contribution to the game is quite significant because it is the closest uh, replica to a hockey stick that we still play with today. Um, we can trace ball and stick games, whether they're on the field or on the ice, to many different nations around the world. That's not necessarily like a, a truly Canadian stamp. Um, but the hockey that we know today has a very good lineage um, to the Mi'kmaq carvers. And that they were so good that Eaton's actually picked up and was selling them, you know, for a commercialized product. Um, I think that that kind of link to early commercialism is super interesting. Um, and the price that they were sold at at the time, I think it was like 25 cents or something like that, maybe for a dozen. Um, and now that it's averaged $300 to buy a hockey stick is kind of, that's also an interesting um, shift in time as well. So let's go over to screen share because we do have an ad for from Eaton's. So this is the Eaton's catalog from fall and winter, 1904, 1905. And yeah, like here it says Mi'kmaq hockey stick. Like it's not, it's, it's not like, oh, we don't know where they got them from. It's really branded as from the Mi'kmaq nation. Yeah. So on the ad here it says, quote, it is an Indian handmade stick. Um, so there is 
recognition of this indigenous heritage to the game, but how quickly that becomes lost um, through time and through commercial commercialism is is really interesting um and the fact that this is printed in 1904 1905 at the same time we also have the colored hockey league of the maritimes taking place which started in 1895 and went through till about 1930 um so you do have very strong connections to black hockey contributions and indigenous hockey contributions at the same time, um, making it really the game that we have fallen in love with today. And yet the erasure of these contributions um, really hasn't been addressed until since I would say maybe the last five years or so, we've started to bring these um, stories back into, um, into a broader conversation and offer kind of like an alternative history to the one that we've largely grown up with. Yeah, I have a follow up question about that related to the stories. But before we leave screen share, I want to show this other photograph that was part of the article that you shared with me, um, an APTN article, which will be available uh, down below the description so that you also can uh, to read the article as well as see the, um, the, the photographs and the sources. But this was a photograph that was in the article um, in the Nova Scotia archives about Mi'kmaq um, carvers creating hockey sticks. And I thought that was a really great image that complemented the Eaton's um, ad. So thank you for sending the whole article. So we got to see these pieces together. Yeah, you can see how many sticks that they're making there. And they look like what we would expect a hockey stick to look like today. Um, and environmentally, it's interesting that we've gone from wood to composite. And now with climate change issues being looming large, um, there's an organization called Good Wood um, that is trying to bring us back to wood hockey sticks. So we're kind of like doing this circular thing. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it'll take off because... Um, wood is just not the same performance as we've gotten used to with composite materials, but it is kind of a, a hearkening back to um, the quote unquote roots of, of hockey itself. Is that a pun? When you say uh, roots? Roots and, 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 tree. and trees? I mean, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, okay, so I have a couple of questions, especially about that last point. So the second question that we have in this series is what is the story? And so one of the things I want to ask you related to when you said like the erasure of a lot of these stories is first, do you think we really are bringing these stories into kind of the mainstream a way we understand hockey? Or do you really think that we are historicizing it? Are you seeing that? I, I mean, I'm an outsider really to hockey culture, but even from a kind of afar, I don't, necessarily see that that is quite present. So I'm interested if you want to talk a little bit more about those stories that you're seeing and the stories that you might want to see. And then the other kind of question that I had, that I don't know if it kind of dovetails, is about the evolution of equipment, right? And about the kind of sports performance and and whether or not moving towards like composite materials, um, like a hockey stick, does move us away from that history. Like if we were more attached to the wood, would be be more attached to the history. I, I don't actually have an answer to that. Do you <laughs> have any thoughts? <clears throat> okay, so to your first question about like, um, are we seeing more diverse storytelling and representation and accurate kind of portrayals of hockey history, I would say yes and no. Um, the fact that you're, you've labeled yourself an outsider is perhaps a better indication of whether these stories are getting out there or not. Um, as somebody who kind of lives and breathes this every day, I'd be like, yes, it is getting better because I see these things happening. Um, an example would be that Canada Post released um, uh, like a heritage memorial stamp of the Colored Hockey Leagues a, a couple of years ago. And that's something that kind of reaches the, the broader Canadian audience. Um, we've seen at least two or three documentaries in the last couple of years being made around like this uh, notion of soul on ice, black ice, again, reviving these histories, um, reanimating them for contemporary society. Um, but yeah, it is definitely still an uphill battle. Like when I work with hockey players and, and I ask them, like, what do you know about hockey history? Colored Hockey League is just like, whoosh, like I had no idea. Or I, I know that it existed, but I don't really understand what the full contribution and how important that group really was. Um, so when we look back at the Colored Hockey League, 
We know now that that's where the original slap shot came from, which historically has been um, assigned to, to a guy named uh, Boom Boom Jeffrey on. Um, but what we have found in like records is that there is an allude to something called a baseball shot in hockey, uh, which George and Daryl Fosty wrote um, about extensively in their book um, about the Colored Hockey League. And so this is the first kind of iteration where we're seeing um, the combination of the summer pastime of baseball with the winter pastime of, of hockey kind of coming together. And in the white interpretation of the game at that time, you weren't allowed to lift your stick above your shoulder. Like it was supposed to be, it was a much slower game. It was more akin to rugby. Like there was no forward passing allowed. Um, and in the colored hockey leagues, you could you could forward pass, you could slap shot. The goalies could drop to their knees and play the puck. Whereas in the white leagues, it was still a very stand-up style game. So the fast style NHL hockey that we watch today with butterfly goaltending, it all goes back to the colored hockey leagues and the alternative rules and alternative interpretations that these black players had. Um, and so I think it's important that we pay homage and, and kind of um, tell, a, tell a more truthful narrative, but also allow racialized Canadians to see that they have always been in this game. It is not like, come join us now for this new cool thing. No, it's like, no, you have a right to this space because it's always been about kind of different groups reinterpreting something and creating uh, something wholly new for themselves. Um, so yeah, I think that those kinds of narratives, you're not seeing them on Hockey Night in Canada, uh, perhaps the the way that we would like to, and maybe to reach that broader audience. Um, but I think shows like Hockey Night Punjabi are another example of like, we have counter narratives that are coming through. Um, there are different ways to understand and enjoy the game and that's okay. And that's really been the friction um, in Canada's history, I think is like, this is what hockey is, this is who plays it. And we don't venture away from that. Otherwise, we start pulling at threads and the whole Canadian fabric kind of falls apart is the fear. Right. And I mean, that's the fear with so many things, which I think really identify like the the fragility of uh, the white nation that Canadian wants to put forward, which is what a lot of my work related to history education is about. And I think that's why it's so interesting to be for teachers to bring these narratives to their history classrooms to be able to identify the ways that that like people of color have always been here <laughs> and have always kind of changed the changed and developed the ideas that we hold on to today and that whiteness gets created through the exclusion right mm -hmm. and I think when you were saying like to show racialized Canadians that they have a right to this space like as a in a hockey arena as a as a hockey player I think that that's such a powerful lesson to be able to bring to these histories if a history teacher is teaching them with their grade seven or eight or grade 10 students that how do we talk about these histories as as erasure and as understanding the contemporary moment as being able to have that right to exist in the complexities and the counter narratives like you're saying and the and the different ways that this can be interpreted yeah, and I think the ironic thing about hockey as a culture is that it is working very hard right now to like make it more diverse, make it more multicultural. And yet, had you just told the actual story from the get-go, it would have been um, because it is naturally multicultural. Um, so there was actually a lot of work that went into kind of pushing um, marginalized, like racialized groups out of that space and women in a lot of ways as well. Um, to tell uh, a more narrow understanding of what Canadianness and, and masculinity is in, in Canada. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think that's such um I think that's such a powerful reminder in our history classes, but also in our spaces of leisure and our spaces of entertainment to, to remember like these, what we see right now was created often for specific purposes of maintaining standards of race and gender and class. How do you think, although we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but maybe more directly, how can you, how do you think that teaching the history of hockey and the kind of diverse multicultural roots of hockey in a elementary or high school classroom, how do you think that that can challenge our broader narratives of Canadian history more generally? 
I mean, I think kids are pretty clever um, and they have really good ways of articulating things that are very complex in very simple ways, which is kind of excellent. Um, but yeah, I think it starts young because we're constantly socializing kids into social norms through what they see and, and kind of how they're policed through their behavior and things. Um, so just being able to see um, like Barbie came out with a Sarah Nurse doll a few years ago, a couple of years ago. I think it was sold through Tim Hortons and stuff. To see a black Barbie doll who plays hockey, you don't really actually have to teach a lot. That in itself is quite important. Um, so having that representation in the classroom, I think is really key. Um, and I've had uh, players from the Women's National Olympic team, like they do a lot of minor hockey coaching and one of the players was interested, like, how do I teach this to my minor hockey kids? Because they were running things called like hockey intelligence sessions. And so there was an interpretation of like, you know, we can talk about intelligence on the ice. We can also talk about hockey intelligence as like just understanding the game quite differently. Um, so I don't think it has to be like this huge history lesson, but I think we have a, a lot of opportunities to just be, to, to drop little nuggets here and there to be like, did you know this, right? Like those kinds of things in classrooms, um, I think can be quite helpful or even having students do a little bit of research themselves. Like what can we find about these people um, and starting kind of like narratives and stories that way. And I, I mean, that's a huge part of the erasure itself is that Western civilization privileges writing which is why we don't have the histories from indigenous and the colored hockey league contributions because they weren't written down necessarily they weren't written down in the ways that we wanted them codified um, there were more oral traditions so if we can kind of bring back oral tradition storytelling and passing that from generation to generation i think that that is also um, one way to create resistance uh, to that kind of dominant narrative too so you mentioned the Color Hockey League, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that and some of the stories related to that. Could you, do you have some stories related to the Color Hockey League let, that you could kind of get into that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the Color Hockey League is how intentional the players and the organizers were about Black resistance through the league, um, that it wasn't just a copycat of what, what white hockey was supposed to be. Um, so the, all of the team names that were chosen for the teams in the league um, spoke to some sort of Black history, empowerment, Black power, Black movement. Um, so one of the teams was called the Mossbacks, and that was in reference to um, the Underground Railroad and trying to move north from the United States in the darkness you feel for the moss on the north side of the trees. Um, so George and Daryl Fossey, again, in their book, they outline quite a few of um, the, the histories that go with um, the, the league itself and some of these small details. Like, it was very thoughtful. And I think that that's really important that it wasn't just like, oh, guys playing hockey. It was like, no, this was a way to assert um, agency in, in a Canada that didn't really allow um, Black citizenship at that time. Um, and there was also a team named the Truro Shakes, which at the time there wasn't actually any um, any acknowledgement of Black Muslim identity in Canada yet. So this might actually be um, an early iteration of Black interpretations of, of uh, Islam and kind of bringing it up to Canada. There's certainly um, a lot of things happening around the 1930s in the United States with the growth uh, with the growth of Nation of Islam as well. So it's hard to think that they're completely um, disconnected from each other. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of stories that haven't been told because people haven't really asked the right questions or known that there were opportunities there. Um, and for me personally, I feel like what we're missing is the Black women's history in Canadian hockey, because we have a few pictures of men playing at the time. And what we know about women's sport is that it wasn't necessarily organized or sanctioned, but it always happened. Um, there's got to be some girl out there at that time who saw her dad or brothers skating on the ice. And when they weren't looking laced up or went out on the ice and took a stick and was kind of stick handling around. And I think that's the history that we need to start really um, trying to, to find. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting with the history of women in sports. And we have done a couple of videos 
related to to that kind of broad topic in this series. But I remember too, when I worked at a large archives, there was a photograph of uh, women hockey players and it was uh, titled Girls Hockey League. And I was like, those are not girls. Those are women. <laughs> those are like, those are grown adult women. And um, it bothered me so much that even in the record, and these were white women, even in the record that we did have, because this was a formal shot of the hockey team, that whether it's through the photographer agency, whether it's through the archivists that did the intake themselves, that biases related to women in sports were brought in through titles. So if you typed in women in hockey, you weren't going to get anything because it was titled as girls. Mm. And, um, and, and it's kind of, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting because that is often how things happen with histories that aren't representing the kind of norm with women, with racialized people. But when you're identifying that kind of intersection of how there is a huge erasure of of women of color who have played hockey in Canadian history. And so therefore, when we understand history, we uh, understand hockey, we think of it as a white man's game, like to deconstruct that and to tell those stories and to have those pass along. You're right. It's not only that we're not asking the right questions. It's like, do we even know who to ask? Some people do, but how can we get those stories to a classroom? How can we get those stories to Hockey Night in Canada? Um, I mean, they're slowly getting there. They are yeah. slowly getting there with changes in personnel um, and the different, there is an appetite as well for um, different kinds of uh, stories being told through hockey. The problem I think right now with Canadian media is that the the philosophy is like, well, we already did a women's hockey piece last month. Mm. Do we really have to do one again this month? Um, so it's like that thing. It's like they know they have to do it and that they should do it. But there's also limited space for those kinds of stories because they're still labeled as like those kinds of stories that they're diversity stories, that they're not actually just like hockey stories in and of right. themselves. Um, so yeah, like the the history of white women's hockey is decent in that we have photographs and we have uh, records of it taking place in like Kingston and Montreal and things like that. But for racialized women in, in Canadian hockey, the, it kind of really starts with Bev Beaver in the 1930s as, as like a young woman who is in residential school and kind of secretly plays hockey with the boys and does so very well. And that they kind of, you know, allow her to um, be in that space as long as possible because she was good on the team. And um, it wasn't until people kind of figured out that she wasn't a boy that they would uh kind of, you know, clamp down on her participation. Um, so we're really kind of starting the history line of the 1960s, which we know is not really possible. There's a large gap in there where racialized girls in Canada must have been playing hockey. Um, and then in a competitive sense, it really starts with Angela James at the 1990 w Women's World Championships was the first time that um, women had a world championship. So again, this is like, this is a huge gap. And we're like, this cannot be where women's hockey history starts in a nation that is so in love with hockey. Um, my colleague, Dr. Mary Louise Adams, has written in uh, 2006 very poignantly that if if hockey is, is Canada's game, then it is decidedly masculine and white. Um, and so we're kind of in that place now where we're starting to have those conversations and pull apart the, the curtains to be like, hmm, it's not really. But again, if these things aren't written down, they're not codified in a way, it's hard to really know where to look um, and how to kind of reanimate um, these things for, for popular consumption. Um, and so do you have some recommendations of of sources or even kind of ways to start bringing those tidbits into the classrooms. Um, you've provided such great references today, such great names. And so for teachers who recognize there's a limitation of sources, limitations of full histories, but want to bring those little kind of tidbits in for challenge challenges. Do you have some recommendations of where they should go or where they should start? I mean, we have listed your publications, your 2020 book down below, along with the other references that you've mentioned on the webpage we created related to this. But do you have any other suggestions, I guess, that <laughs> we will provide then as links um, as well? Yeah, I mean, I would... Um... 
give a selfish plug for Hockey and Society, of which I'm the managing editor of. Um, started in 2011 with uh, Dr. Mark Norman. We were in grad school together, and he just always wanted to start a critical hockey blog about uh, critical blog about hockey. And so Hockey and Society was born as kind of like a grad student um, project side side of the desk kind of thing, but also a way to translate any research that we were actually doing on hockey for a wider audience. So we've got a lot of accessible pieces in there that pull at a lot of the academic research um, about the women's game, about hockey and residential schools, um, about contributions from racialized coaches and players um, that maybe don't you're not going to find on Sportsnet or TSN or um, with quite the same kind of uh, depth. Um, the other site that I might recommend is called Color of Hockey. No you because it's an American site, um, but they do a wonderful job of highlighting current players, historical players and kind of um, telling that counter narrative and, and showing how long and fulsome the contributions to hockey are from black indigenous and other people of color. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, this has been really, really wonderful. Um, again, as kind of a hockey outsider, um, I'm not as like invested in these histories, but the way that you talk about them and the the kind of diversity of stories that we don't know. I'm just like so intrigued to like check out those websites and and do some more reading myself. And so thank you so much. Um, how can people get in touch with you other than the the blog that you've already mentioned? Um, you can find me through the Queen's faculty site. Um, if you Google me through there, you've got my faculty email. Um, you can find me on Twitter as long as Twitter is still operational um, at Courtney Cito altogether. Um, and, you know, th those are definitely Twitter's probably the easiest way to find me these days. Um, but, yeah, I'm around if you Google me. OK, well, thank you so much, Courtney. Is there anything else that you wanted to to share with us as we move into, you know, February and Black History Month? And um, uh, like, I think this is such a wonderful compliment to winter <laughs> and to February. I love Black History Month. There's always so many wonderful stories that we get to continue telling during this month, but really get featured. And so I don't know if there's anything you wanted people in particular to look at this month as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the general takeaway I would be, I would promote is to support women's sports, women's hockey. Um, we've got a lot of growing opportunities um, that never existed before. So I would start there. But two, especially for Black History Month, it's a it's a good way to dive into um, kind of a different kind of hockey fandom is to support Black Girls Hockey Club. Um, they just started a Canadian chapter as well. And it was created by um, Black women who are fans of hockey. And they wanted to create a space that was welcoming for themselves in and around the arena. Um, and they're doing some of uh, the best work that I have seen in and around the rink. So definitely give them a follow, send them a donation if you can, um, show up to one of their meetups if they're in your town. Uh, they're doing some great work. Okay, that's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Courtney. This was really wonderful. And um, yeah, thank you for being part of the series. And we will uh, stay in touch. Awesome. Really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.